Damon, thank you so much for the interview. Um, first of all, um, what is NEV doing in Georgia? And uh, most importantly, uh, why is it doing it? First of all, Otto, it's a pleasure to be with you today, but it's a real pleasure to be back in Georgia. It's my first trip to Georgia as president of the National Endowment and Democracy since uh, coming here first time since the pandemic. Um, I'm a longtime champion and friend of Georgia, the Georgian people, uh, but it's the first visit as president of the National Endowment for Democracy. And I wanted to come here early in my tenure at the endowment because what happens here is important for the future of freedom and democracy. The endowment essentially is, it's America's foundation for freedom and democracy. We are funded by the U.S. Congress, publicly funded, but set up as a private foundation, a private institution uh, to support democracy and freedom around the world. That takes shape by the support that we provide for civil society, independent media, but also through what we call our core institutes, the NED family uh, that's present here in Georgia, the National Democratic Institute, International Republican Institute, uh, the Solidarity Center, and the Center for International Private Enterprise. And it really represents a NED commitment, understanding that our own diversity in the United States and our own democracy, these forces come together at the endowment to support democratic values and institutions around the world. Republicans, Democrats, business and labor in the United States, working together to support uh, grassroots civil society, uh, uh, democratic institutions and values. So the endowment is that expression. And so we're proud to have a long history of supporting the Georgian people and their democratic aspirations. And I'm here to listen, to learn from our partners, to understand their concerns and how best we can be, play a supportive role of the Georgian's people, Georgian people's aspirations. But we also recognize this as a moment. It's a moment for the challenge to democracy and freedom around the world, 16th year of a democratic recession, but it's sharper because of the, uh, the authoritarian repression driven from techniques we've seen coming out of Moscow and Beijing. But obviously the impact here, a wake of a war in Ukraine, the occupied territories in Georgia, it's a volatile moment for Georgia's own future democracy. And we want to be here to support the Georgian people and their aspirations and uh, Georgia's journey to strengthening its democracy in this region. Um, Damon, as you know, the European Union uh, just recently admitted that Georgia has its place uh, in this alliance, but it gave specific tasks um, to the country before officially granting it a candidate status. Um, while, you know, Moldova and Ukraine are a step ahead and they got uh, uh, candidacies. Um, how is this development um, and uh, the failure of Georgia to secure um, the candidacy? seen from the uh, U.S. vantage point. Uh, and uh, what does this mean for Georgia's friends in Washington, D.C.? Well, first of all, I think this is, you know, it's a quite significant. I've long been a supporter of Georgia's aspirations to be part of the institutions of the transatlantic community um, because we've been inspired by and believe in the and see the convictions of the Georgian people for where they see their future as part of a democratic West. It's really quite impressive and, and stunning. And so on the one hand, uh, I have long been wanting to see the European Union be more expansive and welcoming of the aspirations of people of Europe's East. And so it's a big deal. It's significant what European leaders have just decided that there will be a European future for Ukraine, Moldova, and for Georgia. And so this is a significant positive development coming out of a horrific war in Ukraine that's really galvanized Europeans, many of whom used to be quite skeptical of whether you could even imagine a country like Georgia's being European. So there is a good side of progress on this front as we've seen that debate evolved in Europe. On the other hand, for a long time, Georgia was seen as the front runner among these countries ahead of a Moldova or Ukraine with its own democratic reforms. And so I think it is really a, a sign that there is more work to be done. There's concern about that. Um, and it, I, you mentioned the tasks that the EU assigned. I, I tend to think of it a little bit differently. What have Georgians committed to do themselves together? And how do they meet their own commitments? At the end of the day, this whole process of 
to deepening democratic reforms, of joining the EU, of moving towards NATO, it doesn't really work if your concept is, what do we need to do to satisfy Brussels? That's not really the concept. What makes it so powerful, and I saw this when I served in the US government, and I watched the Baltic states, I watched others, is when it really sinks in that people understand, what do we need to do for ourselves to help our own people be secure, to protect their individual liberties, um, to provide our country its security, and understanding that what's happening, whether on a reform agenda or these things, you're not doing that for Brussels or Charles Michel or President Macron. That's not really politically sustainable, or it isn't even it isn't even the right way to think about sort of democratic momentum. It's understanding what's going to be the best pathway so that the Georgian people have their security, have their ability to have their voice, and an understanding that these reforms need to come out of Georgians' commitments to each other to deliver a better future for Georgians so that mothers and fathers can see a future for their children here, and they don't have to think about their kids just going abroad, whether it's for jobs or for freedom, that right here in Georgia, this can become Europe. And I think, I think that transition is really important. So I worry right now, I welcome the fact the EU has signaled that Georgia has a European future. I will tell you when I served in government, you couldn't get some European politicians to even acknowledge that. This is a significant step forward. And yet, it's also a clear sign that there's a bit of concern and disappointment about the lack of progress and movement on the real underpinnings of what a democracy means. And so Georgians shouldn't think about, what do I need to do for Brussels? What does Georgia need to do for its citizens, for its own aspirations? And that's part of the difference of, of thinking about joining NATO or joining the EU. These are associations of choice. We don't need, nobody's asking or requiring Georgia to do something. It really needs to be, does Georgia want a democratic future? If it does, if it wants to be part of these institutions, these are the types of expectations that come with that, but they have to be Georgian aspirations. And right now I think there's some question. There's some, there's clarity that the Georgian people are pretty strong in their conviction of where they see their future. It's compelling. We see it in polling data. We hear it from Georgians across the country, whether rural uh, or, or urban. And yet, I think that continuity of commitment to what it takes to deliver the standards of reform are really important. Coming back, that's partly what, you know, the National Endowment for Democracy is here. Again, not as Americans showing up to say, here's what to do, but how can we support Georgia's journey? So that's why we make commitments to support independent media so that people have access to information, uh, can help manage a uh, information environment rife with disinformation that is, that's dangerous and trying to manipulate the population. That's why we stand by grassroots organizations, which really are an investment in civic engagement and participation, whether it's youth participation, inclusion of LGBT community and political debate. Uh, this is part of the sense of an agency. How do people have a sense of agency in a democratic society? But it's also why we make commitments to Georgians staying connected to their own uh, occupied territories and understanding that there has to be a future there, a pathway there, an attractive Georgia is going to be compelling to Abkhaz wondering about their, their future as well. And so these are the types of, of commitments that we make that are not about the EU. They're really about Georgians' aspirations for its own people, its own democracy. But these investments, I hope, fuel the success of being able to accelerate Georgia's agenda on the EU. It's pretty clear Georgia's made some commitments. And I think you've heard European leaders say, can you meet these commitments you've made? If so, we want to respond to that. But it doesn't just happen. It takes hard work. And there's a question right now, does Georgia have the political will and the political capability in this environment to deliver on its own commitments to deepen this process? Um, there are serious concerns uh, about the potential uh, of instability in Georgia. And some say the government um, uh, instrumentalizes this um, to uh, keep uh, the opposition at bay. 
Um, but the others argue that the opposition is also um, prone to sort of brinkmanship here. Um, how are recent developments in Georgia's uh, internal political scene uh, uh, seen in the U.S., especially as um, the civil society uh, activists are uh, playing more active role in Georgian politics? Sure. Look, I mean, robust politics where parties and politicians uh, have a, a, a full debate is part of the fabric of democratic society. It's a healthy part of it. But you can also see where that becomes unhealthy when the rules of, of, of democratic debate are really pressed. And so this is where civil society, where independent media is so vital, so critical. And so one of the things that I think has become a little bit disturbing is, is this sense of insecurity, as you said. We're hearing from journalists about the concern about their own safety, their security. We saw on July 5th last year, journalists killed, protesters really threatening the lives of those that turned out to, to stand by the rights of the LGBT community. It's part of the reason why we're here right now to underscore solidarity with the Georgian people, with Georgian journalists trying to do their job, uh, with the LGBT community, others. It, it's, it's part of, I think, a sense of any government is in power. When you're in government, you have an added responsibility. And it's hard in democracy to have an added responsibility to help create a conducive environment where there can be an even playing field. And I think many people are concerned about that, whether it's the safety and security of those who want freedom of expression, coverage of, of media, to be able to operate freely, um, or it's the terms of a political debate. And so part of the challenge here is how within a democratic political framework, how can political actors work within these rules to shape Georgia's future? It doesn't just happen automatically. And that's why the role of civil society, the role of media, is an integral part of helping to be part of those checks and balances. And so it is a moment. There's tension. There's, you can feel that, that tension. And, you know, it's a bit concerning. It's a bit concerning. But it's oftentimes these pressures which help force and advance progress in society as well. And so I hope that, that leaders here in Georgia, that activists here in Georgia, see the bigger picture of how to actually strengthen the security that you mentioned, ultimately Georgia's security, it's freedom, the sovereignty of a country that cannot take that for granted. It's freedom as a nation, as a people, I think is really tied to the caliber, to the nature of its democracy. And as Georgia's democracy deepens, is more credible, it becomes a more resilient society, not dependent on one or two people or one or two forces. It becomes a factor where the Georgian people have the agency to help protect themselves. And that deepening of its democracy is what makes the American people, many in Europeans say, Georgia really is part of the West. It deserves to be part of these institutions. And so to have the perspective to understand that yes, these painful sometimes reforms, these difficult reforms, difficult political compromise, things that curtail the power of the state sometimes are actually quite fundamental to ensuring the resiliency long-term of the state because the caliber of Georgia's democracy is gonna be directly related to the depth of American support, American people's enthusiasm for Georgia's place in the transatlantic community. I'm confident about that over the long term. I'm an optimist for Georgia because of the extraordinary creativity, ingenuity, and commitment that I see in the Georgian people. But I'm quite concerned about what happens in the short term. And that's why we're here to demonstrate our support for those aspirations, for peaceful compromise, for a deepening of a reform process, and for respecting the roles that political actors play, civil society has to play, civic engagement is so crucial to getting this right, the constructive role of a, of a church, and, and being part of a, a force for peace and nonviolence in this society. These are things that are really important to support in a tense environment right now. Um, my final question. Um, as we speak, NATO summit is ongoing in uh, Madrid. 
uh, and NATO has adapted its strategic concept uh, doctrine and uh, pledged to protect every inch of the allied territory. Um, and the rapid uh, reaction forces are also set um, to grow on the eastern flank. Um, what are the uh, implications here uh, for Georgia and the wider Black Sea, uh, Black sea region, in your opinion? Thank you. First of all, Otto, I am a longtime advocate and supporter for Georgia's aspirations to be part of the NATO alliance. I had the honor and privilege of serving in the U.S. government, uh, uh, particularly during the Bucharest summit, where I was a strong advocate for beginning a, a very clear process for Georgia to become uh, a, a member, an ally. And I thought Georgia's progress merited that, that, that commitment. And I have seen with my own eyes, as I have supported our work in Afghanistan, as I served as chief of staff at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, and it was Georgian soldiers that provided force protection. I would see them every morning as I left the gates uh, of, of the embassy. I've seen the contributions that Georgia has made to the security uh, of the NATO alliance. And so I'm a believer that part of the challenge in the new Russia that we face, Vladimir Putin's Russia, is that having clarity is security. The Baltic states, Sweden and Finland, by ensuring that there is no uncertainty, no gray zone, we will have peace. So how can this process be a peace process? And it's why ultimately I think that Georgia finding its place within the NATO alliance is an important part of finding enduring peace here in this region so that there isn't the temptation of uncertainty and understanding that the complications of 20% of this country being occupied. It means that we need the ingenuity and creativity that we found in dealing with a divided Germany, with others to understand that a democratic Georgia, the caliber of a democratic Georgia could be part of a free, of an alliance of free nations without giving up its claims of sovereignty to its occupied territories, but understanding the limitations of where Article 5 would apply. So what we see coming out of Madrid, um, Georgia's not front and center, but it is true. It is an American recommitment to European security, a NATO commitment to the security of the Black Sea region, understanding how important this is, and a commitment that NATO enlargement continues as we see with Sweden and Finland in particular. And so this isn't a huge step forward for Georgia itself. But I think if you think about the, conse the, the, the consequences of the overall uh, opportunity, it's creating an infrastructure in which is Georgia gets this right. If Georgia continues to bolster the caliber of its democracy, to continue to reform its armed forces, to continue to partner with democratic nations, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, there is a pathway for Georgia to be a close partner of the United States and ultimately an ally within NATO. Uh, it won't happen to tomorrow. It is tied to confidence and the durability of the democratic institutions. This is why a Sweden-Finland decision was really easy in Madrid. Um, both the compatibility with the alliance security forces, but as importantly, the stability of their democratic and systems of rule of law. And I hope that provides some inspiration, some pathway uh, for Georgian leaders, Georgian politicians uh, to not only think about uh, their security interests, but to understand that democratic reforms bolster national security and that they're intimately related. And to get that right, it's got to ultimately be, despite all differences, to see different political parties different factions of civil society that believe in a common sort of place of where is Georgia's place in the world. And despite political differences to be able to work together towards that goal, that's pretty powerful. Finland and Sweden are in today because we saw a political consensus form across parties, across civil society that made it possible for their politics to deliver. I think it offers some insights uh, for Georgia and its path forward. Thanks so much. Thank you, Otto. It's a real pleasure.